Hi class, welcome to this lecture on the shadow of Paul. While this uh, whole course is a course on James, uh, it's inevitable that Paul comes into this conversation mainly because of the historic relationship between James and Paul uh, that we find in the New Testament. So this, this uh, lecture is called The Shadow of Paul, and it's not just the shadow that Paul casts over the letter of James, but uh, the shadow that Paul casts over the entire New Testament, especially since the Reformation. So uh, we're going to take some time and look at Paul as a figure and, um, and how that shadow has been cast, really. Uh, the painting here is um, kind of the, a famous painting of Caravaggio in the early 1600s, uh, him uh, depicting Paul's uh, transformation, his, uh, when he encountered the risen Christ. And um, there is no mention in the Bible of any horse or donkey that Paul gets knocked off of. But Caravaggio here... Uh, that's, that's how he interprets the scene. It's a famous painting, and it's the only reason I include it. So what kind of shadow? Well, the other thing is Caravaggio, like Rembrandt, does a lot of work with shadow, so I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, but what kind of shadow does Paul cast over the New Testament? So let's look at this. And this right here is an Ethiopian icon of uh, Peter and Paul. Uh, you can see Peter there with uh, the keys, I think. Uh, and, and Paul is the other one. So let's look, we're going to look at a couple of things. We're going to look at Paul's place in his home, own time. What kind of person was he when he was living and working in ministry? What kind of leadership did he have? Uh, then we'll look at Paul's place in the rise of Christianity. So after he died, what was his legacy and how did that legacy shape the rise of Christianity? Uh, and we're going to skip the, you know, from like the rise of Christianity usually goes to about 451 with the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, so we're skipping a ton, like a thousand years uh, of Christian history to get to the Reformation. But we'll look at Paul's place in the Reformation. Uh, and then we're going to jump ahead another 400 years to look at Paul's place in the field of New Testament studies in, uh, in general. So uh, let's talk about this shadow of Paul uh, that he cast in his own time. Now, <clears throat> he was an embattled apostle, and I put quotes here because he certainly understood himself as an apostle. He said that in Galatians, that he was sent to be the apostle to the Gentiles, and Peter was sent to be the apostle to the Jews. Uh, but really, Paul is always fighting for space. Uh, if you read all of his, all of his undisputed uh, letters, and when I say they're undisputed, these are the letters that we absolutely, uh, that the scholar, scholars absolutely agree that Paul wrote. There are others that we really debate that he wrote. But Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, um, let's see, Philippians, Philemon, uh, and 1 Thessalonians, those are the undisputed epistles of Paul. And if you read those seven epistles, every one of them, um, Paul argues really strong about who he is. He talks about his identity uh, in, in at least four of those letters saying that he was a Jew among Jews and, uh, you know, a Hebrew born among Hebrews. He talks about his identity a lot. And when somebody's always trying to tell you how important they are or, uh, and things of that nature, it's usually because people doubt it. So uh, he's always fighting for space in his epistles. And there's this continue, he has continuous and multiple enemies. Uh, throughout his letters, you read First and Second Corinthians, First Corinthians in particular, the first chapter he's talking about, he's negotiating his authority over against Apollos and, and other leaders and preachers in his own time. Uh, Galatians, he asked him, you know, who has bewitched you, you foolish Galatians? Uh, there specifically, he talks about um, 
people who've been brought in uh, that are men from James uh, that are really kind of disrupting some of his work in Antioch with Peter. Um, he's always embattled. He's always uh, facing enemies. Uh, you read uh, Philippians, which is probably the kindest letter he writes. Even there, he has enemies. So um, he's always really kind of saying who he is and kind of claiming his authority because he may not have had as much authority as we think. Uh, usually when you have to fight for authority like that and say that you have authority and repeatedly tell people that you have authority, it might be because you don't have that much or people are doubting it. And then with the enemies that he always uh, refers to, you you wonder uh, how much credibility Paul had uh, with all these enemies that always attack him. And these are different enemies. These aren't the same enemies in every one of these churches. Um, the, what's happening in Corinth is different than what's happening in Galatia. And that's different than what's happening in uh, Philippians. Uh, that's different than what's happen happening in Thessalonica. Uh, these are, these are <laughs> multiple enemies that he's facing. Uh, and so his enemies certainly don't look at him as somebody who has so much authority they can't challenge it. As a matter of fact, a lot of these enemies that he names feels fairly free to challenge his authority as if they may have more authority than Paul himself. And the way some of these letters go, it looks like the people to whom he wrote these letters have been uh, convinced by Paul's enemies that Paul is wrong and the enemies are right, which is why Paul's writing these letters to try to convince them uh, to change and come back uh, to him. <clears throat> so it's, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, Paul in his own time, probably never experienced the kind of authority that he was granted after his death. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so how does he rank among the movement leaders? We'll pay close attention to this uh, in the next lecture when we get to this passage in Galatians. <clears throat> I'm sorry, in, uh, in Galatians. But for the moment, what's important to recognize is that in his own writings, Galatians in particular, he talks about going to Jerusalem and laying the gospel that he preached before the acknowledged leaders in Jerusalem to make sure that he did not run in vain. Uh, that is somewhat corroborated in Acts, where he goes to these same leaders uh, and they, you know, s s give him the right hand of fellowship, but give him some concessions. You know, they say, what you're doing is fine, but you still need to do this. Uh, which, and what they tell him in Acts is different than what he says they tell him in Galatians. So he tells, him in, he tells us in Galatians that the only thing they said, the only qualifier is for him to remember the poor. Well, in Acts, there's actually t three or four qualifiers. They said, yeah, it's fine, but tell them they can't eat meat sacrificed to idols, they can't uh, stay away from blood, stay away from fornication, um, those kind of things. So there were more concessions in Acts, which is written by Luke, who's kind of a mediating voice. So it's clear that Paul does not enjoy the, uh, the, the authority of James in Jerusalem, that's for sure. Um, and it also looks like he goes to Peter uh, in the same kind of way, but then in, he, he rebukes Peter to his face, is what Paul says in Galatians later on. So uh, we know that this is, uh, he has some contention with Peter but he never really doubts the authority of James. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks a little bit about his, uh, how Christ appeared to him as one untimely born, as opposed to the apostles who were with Jesus during his ministry and then uh, appeared to others later on and finally to Paul. So in Paul's own writings in 1 Corinthians 15 and in Galatians, it's clear that he doesn't have the same rank uh, 
as uh, James and Peter and John, uh, these three key leaders in the Jesus movement in Jerusalem. Uh, it, it's just clear. He says it himself. Now, he says that, but he also backtracks and tries to kind of say that, you know, these guys are um, important, but I'm just as important too. So he calls them supposed leaders, so-called leaders. Whatever they are doesn't mean anything to me because I got my revelation from Jesus. I mean, this is exactly what he says in Galatians. But he also is still going to the same people and making sure what he's preaching is okay. He absolutely goes to them for them to either tell him he's doing all right or he needs to change his sermon. So he acknowledges the leaders by his actions, even though his words are kind of um, a little shaky there. Uh, but the whole point of um, Paul and, and the reason he's so controversial is because he absolutely understands his ministry as a ministry to Gentiles. Um, and this is an interesting thing, mainly because in his letters, he only goes to Gentiles. And he, that's from the very beginning, Galatians, which is one of his earliest uh, letters. He talks about being called to Gentiles, being sent to Gentiles, and that is the total of his ministry. So his ministry does not involve preaching the gospel to Judeans or Jews. That's not how he understands his calling. However, in Luke Acts, uh, Acts of the Apostles, Acts has a formula for Paul. Acts always has Paul first going to the synagogue, preaching in the synagogue, being rejected in the synagogue, and then, after being rejected, then goes and takes the Gospels to the Gentiles. So Acts tells us something very different than what Paul himself tells us. Paul never says that he goes to the synagogues first, and in fact, um, emphatically tells us that his ministry is only to Gentiles. And I think this is the kind of the rub, right? He's telling Gentiles that they don't have to be circumcised to be followers of Jesus. And at this point, that's a big, big question mark. Do Gentiles have to, I mean, the Jesus movement is a Jewish movement still. And, uh, and to be a part of a Jewish movement, you absolutely had to follow Jewish law. And Jewish law said you had to be circumcised. It said there was food you couldn't eat, uh, those kind of things. And so Paul's um, caveat, Paul's uh, contribution or uniqueness is the fact that he fully included Gentiles into the Jesus movement without them having to be circumcised. This is the whole nature of the letter to the Galatians. Uh, he also reiterates this in Romans, which is probably his greatest work. Um, it's, it's written to a church that he doesn't know, hasn't been there, um, and he's kind of laying out his gospel in, uh, in Romans, almost like, hey, this is what I believe, so you know, I hope you accept this and let me stay with you so that you can send me on to Spain. It's almost like a, a theological resume, if you will. And so uh, there he talks about um, Gentiles not having to um, follow tenets of the law in order to be a follower of Jesus. And so this becomes a, a major contention in early Christianity. And the contention with Paul in particular is um, he lets Gentiles enter into the covenant with God without circumcision through Jesus. But the question is, is he also saying that to Jews? Do Jews now not have to be circumcised? And uh, this is, that, that is a major debate in early Christianity, and I think that is, this, this is one of the uh, biggest issues the early Jesus movement has to face, and I think Paul and James are, are arguing about this in particular. Uh, so Luke's version of Paul is really different than, than Paul's version of Paul. Uh, 
And there are cer certain section in, in Acts where Luke uses we went here, the, the word we instead of they. Uh, and it looks like the writer of Acts is putting himself into the narrative of Paul, like he was a companion of Paul's at some point. So Luke is kind of like claiming eyewitness account to some of this stuff. But the way Luke writes about it, it, it is different than what Paul writes. But Luke is trying to mediate uh, Paul's radicalness, radicality. I don't know if either one of those are a word, but uh, Paul was radical. I mean, uh, a Jewish New Testament scholar by the name of Daniel Boyarin wrote a great book called The Radical Jew, uh, dealing with Paul himself. John Barclay, another New Testament scholar, calls Paul an apostate Jew, someone who left uh, Judaism because no uh, Jew in their right mind would forsake the law and tell Gentiles they didn't have to follow it. So uh, Barclay calls Paul an apostate Jew. But whether Paul was an apostate or uh, a radical, uh, Luke's version of Paul in, in his Acts of the Apostles is a mediated Paul. Paul is not as radical and Paul is not as apostate in Acts as Paul is in his own letters. So uh, it's, you can't kind of uh, conflate the Paul of Acts with the Paul of his epistles. These are two different things written for two different reasons. Luke is trying to show how uh, this Jesus movement grew uh, and, and grew beyond um, the region of Judea and became something that was a little bit different than uh, Judaism proper. It became its own thing. And so uh, the, this not even right after Paul dies, uh, Luke is writing about this. So Paul in his own time, um, it's obvious that he wasn't as an authoritative figure as other figures in the New Testament, specifically James, Peter, and John to a lesser degree. We just don't hear much about John. Um, but, but Peter is not as highly ranked uh, as those guys, and he wasn't as important. Uh, to the movement at, it, during his lifetime. But um, he becomes a lot more important than any of those figures in the rise of Christianity, um, mainly because he wrote more than they did. <laughs> I, mean, that's, I mean, it's so practical, but uh, James, maybe, I mean, it's debated whether he wrote the book that's attributed to him. So we got this one small five-chapter letter from James. We have seven authentic letters from Paul, six uh, disputed epistles from Paul, so 13 letters total from that's attributed to this one guy. And then Acts, which is, uh, Luke Acts is the largest portion of the New Testament. All of Paul's writings together aren't as long as the Gospel of Luke and Acts together. So the author of Luke Acts has written more of the New Testament than anybody else. But Paul is right behind him. Uh, the other thing is that half of his writings, you know, he wrote a Gospel and the Acts. So most of the Acts deals with Paul's mission. I mean, from chapter, basically chapter 11, 12, uh, to the end of Acts is the story of Paul. So uh, not only does Paul write uh, a large portion of the New Testament, the only other author that wrote more than him uh, spends more than a quarter of what he wrote on Paul's life. So uh, the way Paul's letters and the stories about his life became scripture uh, and came, became a part of the canon solidified his voice as the one of the leading voices in the Jesus movement after that first uh, generation had died off. So Paul is um, traditionally understood as being martyred in about 66 in Rome, Peter about the same time. James is killed in Jerusalem in 62. So, uh, I mean, 
by the 70s, when uh, the Gospel of Mark is being written a uh, decade later, in the 80s, when Matthew and Luke are being written, these are almost second-generation Christians. And by then, because Paul's writings, uh, because he wrote so much, and so much of what became the New Testament is about him, uh, his status as a voice in this early Jesus movement is goes beyond James and Peter. So in his own time, he wasn't as important as these guys. He didn't have as much authority. But after they all died, he did. He absolutely did. And it was because he wrote his uh, he wrote these letters, the church like the the letter to the Galatians, the Galatia is a region, it's not a city. And so he wrote that letter with the intent that it would be passed around to those churches. And that's one of his earliest writings. And, and this is what happens to a lot of Paul's letters. A church gets it, they find it really helpful, they copy it, and then they send that copy to another church. So Paul's letters begin to circulate uh, early on. I mean, not long after he wrote them. Uh, and they may not have been used as scripture per se, but they were absolutely used as guidance during the early Jesus movement among Gentile churches who had uh, may, maybe a copy of the Hebrew or the, the Greek New, uh, Old Testament, but that's all they had. And so these letters that they would get from Paul, that helped them kind of organize their life. I mean, these guys had nothing as far as, they didn't even have a church tradition to go on to help them figure out who was in charge and, and how to meet and what to do when you met. Uh, none of that stuff existed. And so Paul's writings functioned as a guide and they were useful. And because they were useful for one congregation, they would send it off to another congregation. Uh, and, and Paul's kind of authority became even greater. And then you get like the second generation of major Christian leaders. And one of them was a guy named Ignatius uh, of Antioch, which was, you know, Paul spent some time in Antioch. In Galatians, he said he started a church there, and that's where he and Peter got all angry about eating with Gentiles, and the men from James showed up, and Peter withdrew from fellowship. Uh, read Galatians. It's all in there. Uh, but well, that's where Ignatius is from. And Ignatius is a Greek speaker. I mean, he's a Greek writer. He writes a lot of letters, just like Paul did. He actually quotes a lot of Paul's letters while he's writing. So Ignatius was definitely a disciple of Paul, uh, very versed in Pauline uh, thought and theology. Uh, and Ignatius was a he was the bishop. He became the bishop of Antioch. So he was the authority figure in kind of a capital of a this, the Syrian province of Rome. I mean, this is an important place, and Ignatius is an important figure, and he is a disciple of Paul. So most of what Ignatius writes about and the way he writes and who he quotes is deeply indebted to Paul, which makes Paul, you know, it kind of continues Paul's theology and Pauline thought into this next generation. And then a couple hundred years later, I mean, Paul really gets picked up. Uh, Origen writes a commentary on the epistle of Romans. Origen is, uh, you know, he's a famous Greek um, theologian and uh, becomes incredibly important. But look at these other early theologians and church leaders who are, who, these all these guys write commentaries on Paul's letters. Augustine writes one in Latin. Theodore of Mopsuestia uh, and Ambrosiaster uh, and Cyril of Alexandria. They all write uh, commentaries on Paul's writings. Chrysostom uh, writes a whole series of hot sermons uh, on. Um, um, Paul's writings and Pelagius is interesting because Pelagius is ended up, you know, he's condemned as a heretic by the church councils. Uh, so uh, Paul's even used by people who became heretics, right? Uh, Nestorius was another uh, heretic that wrote a commentary on Romans. 
So uh, you see that not after that that second generation, right after Paul's death, uh, that Ignatian Ignatius uh, generation, these guys pick up Paul and really um, kind of move Pauline theology into that second generation. And then Origen and all these other scholars, this is in the first couple hundred years. And, and now Paul is so common that they're writing commentaries on the letter. And these are early commentaries. So uh, they're interpreting Romans as scripture and commenting on it for their congregation. So uh, the first couple hundred years of Christianity, uh, Pauline theology or Pauline thought or and maybe even Pauline Christianity becomes a dominating force in the rise of Christianity. So Paul in his own lifetime, not that famous, certainly one of a one of the leaders of the Jesus movement, but really paled in comparison to other leaders. But he wrote more, and what he wrote was picked up in the next generation and passed down and uh, really kind of affected the rise and growth of Christianity. Uh, and then, you know, we move a thousand years, we just jump straight ahead into the Reformation. Um, and there you get Martin Luther and Paul. Um, Martin Luther um, really got disenfranchised with the Catholic Church. He thought that the Catholic Church needed to reform, so he wrote down 95 uh, his, his thought, he had like 95 ways that the church should reform, called the 95 Thesis. And he posted that and uh, created a, a whole movement called the Reformation that was an attempt to reform the Catholic Church. Uh, it failed uh, to do that, and they were all kicked out of the church, and it, was, it, it started Lutheranism. Uh, but Paul, uh, you know, um, Martin Luther... His use of Paul was, I mean, it, it's what shaped the way he thought about the Reformation. The three pillars of the Reformation was sola scriptura, sola fides, and sola gratia. So uh, only scripture. This is, this is Martin Luther's declaration, right? So basically, we are going to set aside, at this point, 1,500 years of church tradition, and we're going to put that aside, and we're only going to use the Bible to guide us. So kind of a rebuilding the church kind of thing. And uh, what he found in Scripture was his concept of sola fides, only faith, and sola gratia, only grace. So faith and grace become Luther's way to interpret all of Scripture and interpret the Christian life. And he gets it's only faith and only grace from Paul's declarations in Romans in particular, but also in uh, Galatians where Paul says, you are saved by faith, not by works of the law so that no one can boast. Uh, you are saved by faith through grace. Uh, Luther reiterates this over and over and over and over and over again. And these are the pillars of what created the Protestant Reformation that broke away, that eventually broke away from the Catholic Church. Now, most main, well, all mainline denominations uh, come from the Protestant Reformation. Um, the, the Episcopalians were maybe an exception to that because Henry VIII broke away from the Catholic Church because he felt like he was had the authority of the Pope and didn't want to uh, accept the authority of the Pope. So he broke away for different reasons than Lutheranism or Presbyterianism. But uh, you, we still kind of lump them all together. Um, so if you're an Episcopalian and you hate that, then I understand. And if you're a Methodist or any kind of derivation of Methodist, Methodist, uh, they broke away from the Church of England or the Episcopalians to because they disagreed in method, but uh, nothing else. So all the formalities and liturgies are the same, but they played uh, piano music instead of organ music, basically. So, uh, but it, all of these are still deeply ingrained in the way Luther interpreted Paul.
Uh, and, and Luther himself, because he was so Paul-centric, he ended up calling the letter of James a right strawy epistle or a, an epistle of weeds. And he argued that it should the, the letter of James should be taken out of the New Testament altogether. And as a matter of fact, when he and, and he couldn't get that passed, like people would not let him take James out of the New Testament. So what he did was when he translated the New Testament into German, he put the letter of James at the end of the Bible. So it was at, he put James at the, behind Revelation uh, because he was so frustrated with the book, and he felt it was because. James contradicted these uh, major uh, tenets of Paul, which is only faith and only grace. All right, so fast forward again. Uh, the rise of biblical studies happens maybe 175 years ago. This is when people started uh, using more kind of scientific thought to read the New Testament instead of reading the Bible as from a from a church perspective, uh, people tried to be more objective in reading it and uh, for what it says instead of how it supports the church. So the modern biblical studies is only about 150, 175 years old. But Pauline studies within the broad field of New Testament studies, Pauline studies is a subfield within itself. And some of the most important scholars in New Testament studies today are Pauline scholars. And I mean, you can just rattle these guys off. Like N.T. Wright is certainly one of the most popular New Testament writers out there today. Uh, he's a Pauline scholar for the most part. James Dunn has done more work on Paul than anybody. E.P. Sanders. Uh, it's just you go on and on and on about Pauline scholars, and there's just a lot of them. Uh, so, um, it makes up a bulk of the New Testament, uh, studies. So Romans, uh, which is Paul's magnus opus, already told you that, uh, tends to be one of the most studied books of the New Testament. And I would put it up there with one of the gospels. I mean, uh, people don't, I mean, people do work on Mark, but for whatever reason, not a lot of people are Markan scholars, uh, there are a lot of Matthean scholars, uh, Luke scholars. John tends to be the most uh, studied gospel among the four. And I think Romans is kind of right there with it. It is, a, I mean, uh, all the major theologians in the past uh, 100 years have all worked with Romans. And these are theologians. These are not biblical scholars. Uh, and so uh, Romans tends to be Paul's most important work still because of how much uh, work it's actually produced. And the only figure in the entire New Testament that has that is more popular to study uh, than Paul is Jesus himself. And so you have a lot of Jesus scholars, uh, but Paul is just right there. And so a lot of people argue that while Jesus uh, was certainly st certainly started a new thing, it was Paul that created Christianity because it was Paul that started the missionary journey stuff and uh, started taking uh, this this message to Gentiles. And so uh, a lot of scholars will argue that while Jesus was the the leader, what created the movement, Paul created Christianity. Um, and I think Paul in the second generation certainly kind of has that kind of force. But so let's just kind of recap the shadow of Paul. I mean, this is why it's such a big shadow. Uh, James was much more important and much more authoritative uh, in the early Jesus movement. Nobody looked to Paul for an ultimate answer. Uh, people looked to James. He was the main leader. Uh, and Paul was seen as an outsider. I mean, uh, he tells himself that he was a former persecutor. Acts tells that story three times. So the fact that Paul at some point persecuted this early Jesus movement and tried to kind of snuff it out, he, he tells that story himself. It gets told about him three times. So everybody knows that. 
right? And it might have been some of the reasons why people were suspicious of him so early on. But, you know, by the, by the time he's killed, uh, you know, people get it. But his own credibility was doubted most of his life. But he wrote more than James, and he, uh, and he started a lot of churches, and he visited churches. James, for all we know, stayed in Palestine all his life. Uh, probably raised in Galilee, comes to Jerusalem to lead the movement from Jerusalem, but that's where he is, and Paul is always traveling. He starts a lot of these churches that he writes letters to. Uh, he comes back and visits them. I mean, he's out there with the people, and that pays, I mean, that makes a huge difference, uh, and, and I think uh, long term, I mean, he did that all his life, so by the time he dies, uh, the ball was already kind of rolling in his direction. So his historical legacy then became larger than he was in his own lifetime. And it's that legacy that cast a shadow over the entire New Testament and the entire field of New Testament studies. So as you read Luke Timothy Johnson, he really kind of pushes back about reading James on James's own terms and, you know, don't read James uh, in the shadow of Paul. But there's no way you cannot do that. Uh, so this whole lecture was to kind of frame that for us so that we can see that, of course, we're going to be reading the letter of James in the shadow of Paul because you cannot get out, out of the shadow of Paul. It's almost like a solar eclipse. Uh, you know, Paul is prominently there. And when we approach the letter of James, uh, we approach it in the shadow of Paul. Um, and so Johnson kind of says, try not to do that. And, and you know, we're going to read James on James's terms for sure, but I hope this lecture helps you see how it happened, right? That, that in the first century, when, when James and Paul were all alive, nobody would have thought that Paul was more powerful than James, or even that, that James was, I mean, or nobody would have thought that Paul was more correct in the way he understood the gospel than James, who was Jesus's brother. I mean, nobody would have given him that kind of credibility in his own life. But it wasn't long after that that uh, Paul's legacy just became much larger and outdid the legacy of James and the other uh, leaders of the movement. So that's the shadow of Paul. Uh, next lecture, we're going to look at... Um, Paul in the shadows. So we're going to see where Paul kind of pops his head up in the letter of James as James takes some of the Pauline thought and takes it to task. So we'll look at that uh, next go around. If you have any questions, please just uh, send me an email. And I hope everybody's been okay after the hurricane. Uh, Irma really kind of threw everybody back and threw everybody for a loop. Um, my prayers have gone out to so many of you guys who have uh, really suffered under this and had to be evacuated um, and, uh, down in Florida, but even up in Georgia when um, electricity and stuff went out all, all through that area. Uh, please know that you've been in my prayers, and I, I hope that life returns to a semblance of normality for you sooner rather than later. Peace be with you. Bye-bye.